So we have uh, two approaches. One, how does the brain fall asleep? The other one is when does the brain fall asleep? Uh, and let's start with the first one. And that starts with uh, actually approximately 100 years ago with uh, von Economo. He uh, was working with uh, patients and uh, they had uh, two different problems with sleep. And he was lucky enough. I mean, I don't think the patients were very lucky because they eventually died. But he was lucky enough to take post-mortem uh, brains and, and look at, at, at lesions that he could find there. And he saw that there were areas in the, in the thalamus uh, and hypothalamus that were lesions. And then he, the patients would have uh, prolonged insomnia. And there were other areas in the brain that were lesions. And then they would become very sleepy and basically sleep most of the time. And um, he uh, came to the conclusion that sleep and wakefulness is regulated here in the uh, in the hypothalamus in these areas. And now I'm going to make a, a jump to uh, almost 100 years later, where we have now um, these two systems uh, for, for sleep and arousal in the brain. On the one side, we have the ascending uh, arousal system that consists of, of uh, many different um, um, areas in, in the brain around uh, the hypothalamus and the pons that are uh, wake active. And they uh, release acetylcholine, histamine, serotonin, uh, noradrenaline, and dopamine. So the monoamines, the classical monoamines that we know that regulate uh, sleep and that spread uh, through the brain, uh, through the cortex, uh, and, and basically keep uh, the, the brain awake or are awake, active during wakefulness. Later on, uh, orexin was also discovered as one of these uh, wake regulating uh, 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 neurotransmitters, but that was only discovered 20 years ago, whereas the other ones were already known for, for, for the 1960s and 70s. And then eventually you have uh, GABA and, and melanin concentrated hormones who sort of uh, tweak, tweak the system in detail and together they keep, uh, keep uh, the brain awake. Then you have uh, here the, the two yellow ones in, in the ponds. They are active uh, basically during waking and REM sleep. So during REM sleep, uh, uh, what is released mostly is acetylcholine. Uh, and that uh, is enough to give the brain this, uh, this wake light state uh, and, and give you also uh, some kind of uh, consciousness state that uh, then is in the brain, but it's, it's, the brain is by itself. It doesn't uh, reach uh, information from the outside, doesn't reach, uh, reach the brain or the cortex. And, but this is basically, the, these are the centers that are active during uh, waking. And then on the other hand, we have uh, the ventral lateral preoptic area that is uh, active during non-REM sleep. And, and what it does is uh, actually inhibit the activity of these, these uh, areas that are active during waking, uh, mainly with, with GABA, but also with, with galanin. And so we have the ascending arousal system on, on the one side, or the ascending reticular activation system, uh, also abbreviated with ALAS, that keeps you awake, and, and the ventral lateral preoptic area that promotes sleep. And before the discovery of uh, orexin 20 years ago, um, people were always a bit wondering, how does this, this come about? Because it was sort of a, a system that was in one state or in the other state, it, it was not very uh, stable. Uh, it, it resembles a bit uh, an electronic uh, flip-flop circuit um, with where you have one light or the other light on, but not both lights at the same time. And uh, basically that um, gave Saper the, the idea to coin uh, the flip-flop model as a, a model for, for sleep regulation. And uh, orexin is then the one that, that stabilizes the flip-flop, which then later changed into a, a seesaw, but it's still a flip-flop system, uh, as, it, as it is called. 
which where erection stabilizes uh, the wake state, but uh, when the system goes over to the sleep state, it doesn't interfere with sleep because then the ventral atrophy of the uh, of that area actually also inhibits the erection uh, uh, area. Now, if you do not have erection, that is basically also the reason why eventually it was discovered, is then you uh, suffer from, from narcolepsy, uh, and then your states are not stable. You tend to, to fall asleep at, at, uh, at inappropriate times. You are uh, having REM uh, sleep onset sleep, uh, sleep onset REM sleep. Uh, you can have these cataplexies where you are uh, paralyzed, uh, like in, in REM sleep state, but you are still aware of your environment and, and, and things like that. So then you get sort of a mix of, of states uh, if you do not have the, the erection uh, available in your brain. Now, that is one way of looking at, 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 at sleep. The other one is, is looking at, uh, okay, when does the brain uh, fall asleep? And uh, for that, uh, there are basically two sleep regulatory processes um, uh, envisioned. One is uh, the homeostatic process, which is also called process S or process H where uh, sleep pressure builds up during waking and decreases uh, during sleep. Um, we can all feel with that. I mean, the longer we are awake, the more sleepy we feel. And uh, if you have slept uh, a lot, then you are actually awaking, uh, refreshed and alert. The other one is the circadian process, also called process C where sleep is timed at the same time of day, uh, every day, like uh, many other processes, uh, basically. Um, the, for the sleep homeostat, we have to look a bit at sleep and the EEG. Um, I'm an animal researcher, so I'm, I'm doing this with this, this uh, mouse EEG here and, and, and mouse uh, muscle activity, EMG. We see here uh, the, the, the the signals uh, of 16 seconds of EEG and EMG uh, of a sort of waking state, non-REM sleep state and REM sleep state. And you can uh, clearly define the three states based on these uh, two uh, signals. And if you do that for uh, 48 hours, you can see that the animal, which is a nocturnal animal, is, uh, is uh, less awake here and more sleeping here in this 12-hour period. And here, when the dark uh, waking increases, non-REM sleep decreases, and this is then its active phase. And you see, you see it's, it's, a, it's a mouse, so it's not 100% awake in its active phase. It's just 70 to 80% of the time awake. Here we do a sleep deprivation, where uh, we sit actually uh, close to the animal, not too close, but we uh, watch the EEG and we watch the animal and if you think that it's going to uh, want to go to sleep then you give it something to do uh, like giving him some nesting material or some other interesting stuff and then you keep him awake here for six hours and then here we have the recovery after the six hours sleep deprivation you can see there's here less waking than on the baseline day there's more non-REM sleep than on the baseline day so we can see that we took something away and it's taking it back after the, after the sleep deprivation. So there is some kind of homeostasis in the amount of sleep that the animal is getting. But there's more to it than that. Um, when you have an EEG, you can also make a spectrum of, of the, the signal, looking at the different waves contributing to this, this, this signal. Like you can uh, you have a piece of nuke shit and uh, uh, look at the low pitch uh, noise and the high pitch uh, noise. You can also here look at different frequencies in the EEG. We usually do that from 0 to 25 hertz. And you can see then that in waking and also in REM sleep, there's a peak around 5, 6, 7 hertz. In waking, it's a little bit faster. But that's the dominant frequency in this species of EEG. Whereas when you go into non-REM sleep, you can see that this there's much more it's, it's slower, it's also higher amplitude, and the slowness you can see then here in this peak below 5 hertz. And these are very important when you go and look for uh, sleep homeostasis. So we're going to look 
at those a little bit more. Now I'm switching to uh, actually a, a piece of human sleep. Here you have uh, the eight hours of sleep in a human, which is uh, scored into the different vigilance stage that we have in humans, waking, dominant sleep stage one, two, three, and maybe even four. With uh, here, the, the sleep with the most slow is. Here we have uh, the, the, the more, more, more superficial sleep, and this is sort of the, the transition between waking and sleep stage one. And here we have REM sleep. And when you look at that over the entire night, you can see that there's a cycling of non-REM sleep, REM sleep, non-REM sleep, REM sleep. But you can see also see that the deeper states are at the beginning. And this is something you see then also in this slow wave activity. You have more slow wave activity at the beginning of the night in the first cycle, in the second cycle a little bit less. And from cycle to cycle, you see that it decreases slowly over the night. Now already very early in sleep research, I'm talking about end of the 1930s, people discovered that if you look at the prominence of slow wave in a night, and you look at how difficult it is to wake somebody up, and they did that with uh, noise, then you see that, that there's some kind of relationship between the slow waves and the depth of the sleep. It is more difficult to wake somebody up when you have uh, a lot of slow waves in the, in the EEG. This has been later confirmed with, with, with uh, proper uh, calibrated decibel uh, measurements. This was in the 1930s. It was done by dropping a, a weight on a, a scale. And then and if you do that from a higher uh, height, then uh, the scale makes uh, more noise. But if you look at, at this non-REM sleep slow wave activity, and you look at a, a rat or a human, you have in the human these one, two, three, four uh, cycles of non-REM sleep, REM sleep, non-REM sleep, REM sleep. You can see that in the course of the night, on average, this slowly decreases, this slow wave activity. And you can see that here in the average values. You do the same for the rat. This is its uh, light period, wake light period. You can see that it starts with high slow wave activity and gradually decreases to uh, lower levels in the course of the main sleep period. Of course, it wakes up now and then, but you can see sort of this gradual decrease, and you can see that also here. Now, if you then keep the rat awake for 24 hours and let the human skip a night, you can see that the sleep after that starts off in both with much higher slow wave activity, and this then decreases again in the course of the main sleep period in both. So this is an, an uni universal reaction of a mammal to uh, respond to sleep deprivation. The next, the sleep after that is deeper, has more slow wave activity. You can play with this. Uh, you can see what happens if you have different durations of sleep deprivation. Uh, I've done that in my own species. I can call this my own species because this is uh, the Jungarian hamster. Um, my species is full of sleep. My PhD species is full of sleep of this, this particular animal. And uh, eventually, we also did uh, two durations of sleep deprivation. And if you keep the animal awake for one and a half hours, you get a nice increase to 150% of baseline in this slow wave activity. But if you do this for four hours, you can see that it increases to 200% of baseline uh, uh, in slow wave activity. And then this gradually decreases in the course of the sleep period after that. Now, this has been done in rats and humans and cats, ground squirrels and mouse. And uh, in all of them, you see this sort of response. There is something in the brain that keeps track of the duration of waking and expresses that in the sleep after that. Now, if you then turn this around, do it the other way around, you can test this by letting somebody take a nap. So here we have the baseline again, four sleep non-REM REM sleep cycles with slow wave activity. And then uh, in the following afternoon, evening, you let them nap uh, and have one complete non-REM sleep cycle. Uh, you can see that nice slow wave activity there. And if you then go in the evening and in the night, let them sleep again, you can see that the post-nap level is much less than uh, in the baseline level. So you can see that 
also this sort of has uh, its repercussions on, on the sleep after that, the depth of sleep at, at, at night, if you do a nap in the afternoon, evening. Now, then slowly we come to a sort of a model situation where we have here the initial value at the beginning of the night, the large value in slow resistivity at the end of the night, and here we have some naps, naps that were done uh, in, in the lab in, in Groningen in the in the 1980s, um, where if you go to bed at 10 o'clock in the morning, you produce very little slow wave activity. But if you do that later, uh, you, you're up uh, a little bit longer and nap in the afternoon, then you have more slow wave activity. If you let these people come back, sleep in the evening, you can even see that this makes a difference if you slept in the morning or in the afternoon, what the level of slow wave activity will be in the evening. Now, and you can already see that you can fit a model through this. Um, and this is exactly what has been done. We have here the simple model of sleep homeostasis that decreases and increases, decreases during sleep phase, increases during the, the wake phase. We have here the sleep deprivation uh, and here the nap. Uh, this, is, this is the simple model for process S as it uh, is uh, presented. Here you can see how it works in, uh, in, in a mouse, and that works quite well. But if you uh, let uh, Peter Achemann and Alex Borbe really work on it, and, and if you know, they know when the, the person goes to sleep, when the REM sleep uh, periods are, then they can predict on a ridiculous level of detail how deep uh, a person will sleep uh, in, in, in the subsequent uh, non-REM REM sleep cycles. And this is basically uh, textbook uh, knowledge now. So there is more to sleep homeostasis than just uh, sleep depriving and gaining some sleep back or some non-REM sleep back or some REM sleep back. If you look at the cumulative loss or during a sleep deprivation in this particular group of uh, mice, and you look at what they gain in amount of non-REM sleep or REM sleep, you can see that they actually do not reach the baseline level. What is lost here, they will never uh, recover uh, uh, back. REM sleep a little bit more than non-REM sleep, but it will not recover completely. But if you then incorporate uh, the response in uh, slow wave activity during non-REM sleep into this uh, recovery process, then you can see that if you look at cumulative slow wave energy, which is the combination of the slow wave uh, activity together with non-REM sleep, then within a couple of hours, uh, the animal reaches the normal baseline levels again, and there's no significant difference between the two. So. Sleep homeostasis is not only recovering the amount of sleep, but you can also recover sleep by uh, sleeping more intense or more deep uh, or deeper. Now that's one side of, of the story. Um, the other side is that um, if you have this hourglass and you assume that, okay, you go to sleep and you sleep and you sleep until you reach a, a lower threshold and you wake up and you are awake and you're sleep pressure increases until it sort of reaches a sleep threshold. You can, you can think about it like that, and that in principle could work. However, when you then decide to stay up longer because there's a party or you have some work to do, then after that you will never get uh, back to the proper timing because you're out of pace with the outside world if you assume that the sleep, sleep threshold and the waking threshold are stra straight lines. So we need some kind of clock. We need some kind of clock that, that, that manipulates these thresholds. And that is uh, exactly what, what has been proposed in this model, that there's a process C, a circadian process that modulates these thresholds. And there's a process S that, that goes up and down uh, between these thresholds uh, and uh, makes the decision if I reach the th lower threshold, the brain wakes up. If I reach the upper threshold, the brain, the brain uh, goes to sleep. Now, from process C, we know 
uh, that this is located actually uh, directed from the suprachiasmatic nucleus, but that the thresholds are also in the suprachiasmatic nucleus is actually unknown, and it's very unlikely that they are there. And process C, yeah, we, we don't know exactly where it is. We know that we can measure it on the cortex by measuring EEG cell reactivity, but we don't know exactly where it is located. Now, why were these two, how was this introduced like this? There are some strange circadian effects on sleep when you look at uh, sleep regulation. Uh, this is an, an old experiment from, from Augustet and Gilbert from the 1980s. And they actually asked people to uh, they sleep deprive them a bit for a couple of hours longer, and then they said told them to go to bed, to sleep, and to stay in bed until they felt refreshed. So get up when you feel refreshed. And what they noticed was that the total sleep time actually decreased uh, in the first couple of uh, sets, and only when the sleep deprivation was becoming very long, then also the total sleep time would increase. Now. If you look at the lower threshold that sort of tells the system to, to wake up or the model to wake up, you can also see that if you go and sleep a little bit later and you follow this trajectory, then you eventually will reach this uh, increasing level of, of the, the threshold, which makes that you actually sleep a little bit shorter than you normally would do. And only when you go over the threshold, then your sleep will be much longer like it will be over here. Now you can see that this model didn't really fit, and this is a, a, a simple sine wave, and that's probably why you see a skewed uh, line here in, in the eventual model that was introduced to, to, to better simulate uh, these kind of uh, uh, irregularities between the model and, and, and uh, the real data. This was one of the reasons why it was introduced. The other reason was uh, spontaneous internal desynchronization that was uh, discovered by Ashoff and Weaver when they had uh, human subjects in uh, their bunker in, in Ambex. In, in, uh, and these people stayed there for yeah, more than 40 days without uh, having a, a, a clue of what the time of day was. And they were, could go to sleep and wake up whenever they, they sort of felt for it. They just had to keep a regular, uh, what they thought was a regular sleep, sleep schedule. And uh, black is, is, is waiting. Uh, the, the, the triangle is the, the, the peak of, of body temperature. And you can see that this goes very well for a long period of time. Period is approximately 25.6 hours. And then hop, suddenly something goes wrong here. Uh, the sleep wake cycle seems to skip at the dip, uh, whereas the, the temperature cycle goes on with 25 hours, uh, the sleep cycle over average overall goes to 29 hours. But you can also see that it sort of hops over, keeps in time again, hops over again, stays in the time again, and hops over again. Now, this is very peculiar uh, behavior for a sleep-wake cycle. And um, the idea was, OK, are there now two clocks, one for uh, the temperature and one for the sleep, or what is going on here? and uh, the, if you look at uh, how you can tweak uh, this system, you can at some point come to a, a situation where you, where you skip days, where you sort of miss the upper threshold and you go to the next one. And if you tweak it well enough, then you can even sort of reproduce uh, this, uh, this, this, this behavior in the model, uh, because here you have uh, the model simulation of the situation on this side. And this was basically uh, the reason why the, 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 the model was introduced, because it sort of suggests that there's this loose coupling between sleep and the clock, or between sleep homeostasis and the clock. And this is what sort of 40 years ago came out, and this is sort of the framework that I'm also uh, working in, and that is called the two-process model of sleep regu regulation, where you have the, these, 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 wake, these sleep threshold, the wake threshold, and you have the, 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 the sleep pressure uh, going up and down and, and meeting the threshold at some point, uh, deciding uh, for the model to go to, to sleep or to wake up. And this is something you can even try at home and see, OK, what is my optimal timing when I'm, uh, when I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of the night and I'm going to sleep? When should I actually wake up? 
that is approximately here. Should I set my uh, timer here or should I wait until I reach my threshold here? Uh, I know from inside information that, for instance, Domain Beersma has been calculating on this uh, quite a lot, but also did a lot of uh, night shifts, actually sets his timer here instead of waiting until he re reaches the threshold. Because his idea is that if you trust the model, you should also live by the model and, and uh, get up at the time that your model uh, re reaches a, a level that you normally would have during the day. Now, I've shown you this, and I've shown you something else, and they don't seem to touch each other at all. Uh, I've shown you the homeostasis and, and, and the circadian clock, and they are not even in this model. Now, this is, uh, this is from a paper of, of, of Saper uh, in, 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 and others in 2005 in Nature, and he has actually included also a figure of the SCM. Um, and its outputs uh, to the source of medial hypothalamus. And then you see, okay, there's some inference maybe through the lateral hypothalamus to wakefulness and sleep and to the ventral lateral preoptic area uh, to, to, to also inference sleep. But you see that they are not very much uh, integrated in each other and we are still sort of lacking a good idea of how to do that. Um, then the people are making, trying to make figures like these, uh, me included, where we then have the SCM that goes and influences dorsal media hypothalamus uh, with, a, with, a, with a sine wave. And depending on the time of day, it sort of uh, uh, inhibits the ventral lateral preoptic area or, or stimulates the, the lateral hypothalamus to then sort of get this into motion. But there's really no good idea about how these all communicate with each other. If you would be able to do that, you would sort of get to the unifying theory of sleep regulation, and that would be really be a big step forward. Now, in my work, I'm looking at uh, the interactions between the clock, the skating clock, and the sleep homeostat, and uh, I'm, I'm going to show a few things uh, of that. Um, it started off with, with uh, actually recording EEG, uh, simultaneously with electrical activity in the suprachiasmatic nucleus and to see what, what if that could bring us any, any further. And then from there you can then make pictures like this. So you can have from the EEG your slow wave activity. You see your homeostat increasing in the, in the subjective day in the main sleep period. And you can actually also see it in the naps increasing in the course of the subjective night. Here we have the, the vigilant stage, waking, non-sleep, and REM sleep. And here we have the firing rate of SCN neurons. So this is the ensemble of neurons that we pick up with the electrode. And uh, you can see that this activity is high during the subjective day and low during the subjective night. And on top of that, I mean, there's sort of a, a baseline level here. And then there's these, these peaks here that, that, that seem to sort of, is that noise or is what is that exactly? And we discovered, actually, this is not just noise or, or artifact. This is something that, that happens uh, depending on the, on the state. If the animal goes from non-REM sleep to REM sleep, you know, okay, in non-REM sleep, you have a lot of slow wave activity. In REM sleep, there's hardly any slow wave activity. So you see a decrease in that. But in the same time, you see that the REM sleep, there's an increase in firing rate in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The same you see when the animal goes to waking, and, and when the animal goes from to waking to non-REM sleep, you actually see a nice decrease in firing rate. So the SCN responds with its firing rate to changes in, in vigilance state. So it knows, or it, 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 it is, firing rate is influenced by uh, state transition. And from there, we uh, decided, OK, let's see what happens if we do a sleep deprivation. So here we have the. Uh, again, the baseline with high uh, neural activity during the uh, subjective day, low neural activity during the subjective, subjective night. Here we do the sleep deprivation of, of six hours. And you can see that we have a very nice increase in slow wave activity in this graph compared to the baseline. You can also see that we have a large reduction in neuronal activity compared to the baseline condition. 
Now these are the averages here where we have here the baseline neuronal activity. Here we have the sleep deprivation and here you have the suppression in the first hours after the sleep deprivation and neural activity. And then we had a reviewer that wanted to see, okay, but you didn't you just break it here? Does it come back to baseline? Luckily, we had another cell for 24 hours for each animal to, to add. So we could add 12 hours here. And you can see that it nicely comes back to baseline levels in all of these, these, these uh, variables. So we, we didn't break it, but we can see that there is a short reduction, uh, short lasting reduction in, in SCM neural activity, approximately as long as the slow wave activity is up. So it, it seems to be related to the sleep deprivation itself. And, and the level of, of, of pressure that we have built up uh, from the sleep deprivation. Now, this is interesting because uh, before that, uh, Misselberger already showed that if you have hamsters and you try to phase shift the hamsters by light, um, this becomes very difficult if you sleep deprive them beforehand. So he had hamsters that he sleep deprived um, and he uh, tried to phase shift them with light. And if the, the normal situation is that you can phase shift them by approximately an hour with that light, but if you sleep deprive them uh, for 24 hours, uh, they don't phase shift anymore. Now, others and also us have, have replicated that, uh, among others, in, in mice. Uh, this, is, this is our example in, in the mouse where we have uh, the light pulse and we have the sleep deprivation with the light pulse. And you, see, you can see that the, the, the phase shift is, is much, much, much reduced. We didn't do 24 hours sleep deprivation. We only did six hours of sleep deprivation. That was enough to get the effect. Sleep deprivation only doesn't do much. Now, Helen Burgess then did an experiment where she um, sleep restricted people and tried to shift them um, with, with uh, light. And also there, it, 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 it turned out that if you have a sleep-restricted person, then the, the dim light melatonin onset does not shift as much as when you have uh, 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 people that were able to sleep eight hours uh, a night. So also in humans, this seems to be uh, working that way. Uh, we decided to, to then do another experiment because um, you can actually see the light response in the suprachiasmatic nucleus by looking at uh, the firing rate of the neuron. Uh, here you see a firing activity of a neuron, and this is where the light goes on. And then you can see that this is, uh, this is 100 seconds of light. You can see that the, the activity of the neurons is much increased. And as soon as you turn off the light, the activity goes back to baseline. Now, this is not only dependent on when the if the light is turned off and or on, but it also depends on the level of, of the light, how strong the light is. So this is this is uh, the different uh, light levels. This is the highest level that we tried. Then you have a very nice response, but if you go two log units lower, you hardly get a response anymore. And we wanted to try and see if we can uh, see something like that also after a sleep deprivation. So we did. Uh, this kind of experiment, this is the multi-unit activity of, of a sample mouse. And we decided to do a sleep deprivation here, which is uh, at the end then in the subjected active phase, where we then gave a light pulse at, at circadian time 14 to see if we could induce a, a, a response there. And this is the control situation. So we gave, uh, after this period, a CT14 uh, Six, six light pulses, and every time you can see that the, the light, so uh, as the light goes on, you can see that the level is increased compared to what you have if the light is turned off. Now, if you do a sleep deprivation, you can see that this response is much reduced. And, and, and these are the averages. Now, of course, then the question is, okay, what is changing in the brain? And one of the things that uh, seems to change is the brain, and the brain is the ad adenosine level uh, in, in the brain that is uh, released when, uh, when the neurons are active. <coughs> uh, ATP is, is broken down uh, through ADP to AMP, and, and through this equilibrium uh, reaction, there's also adenosine then in, 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 the, in the cell. And this is actively 
transported to, to, to the extracellular space, and there it goes and sits on adenosine receptors. Um, and if it sits on adenosine receptors, depending on the receptor, but the most uh, prominent uh, activity is that it, it reduces the activity of, of the neurons. So the neurons start to fire slower. Now, this is some data of adenosine measurement in, in, in cats. Uh, the longer they are awake, the higher the adenosine level. And if you let them sleep, uh, adenosine levels uh, go down again. Now, why is this interesting? Uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, the reason that we drink caffeine is because it blocks uh, adenosine receptors. So if you, if you uh, drink caffeine, you, you, you oppose this, 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 uh, this, this uh, mechanism and it makes you uh, feel more re refreshed and, uh, and, and, and alert. Uh, and indeed, if you give uh, people caffeine before bedtime, you can see that you actually can also suppress uh, the slow waves compared to a baseline or a post-caffeine night. Um, and there's even been the idea that uh, with using caffeine, you could reduce uh, the build-off of process S. Now, it, it turns out that it's much more complicated than that. In, in the beginning, people thought adenosine is process S. No, it's not, but it helps you fall asleep. By, uh, the the build-up of this, this, this adenosine extracellular space definitely helps you fall asleep and because it reduces the activity of neurons. So if we now would do the same experiment, we give uh, we, in, we do the sleep deprivation, but we give some caffeine, uh, inject some caffeine and wait 20 minutes. Then indeed, we can again increase the, the, the response to uh, light again. Uh, and these are, are the averages. So apparently, this reduction in, in, in response after a of, uh, to light after a sleep deprivation in the suprachiasmatic nucleus is mediated by a, a buildup of adenosine in, in SCN area. Now, a couple of years later, uh, people started doing experiments with, with uh, um, acute and chronic caffeine, and they actually could show that if you give an animal caffeine, uh, the phase delay to a light pulse is much larger uh, than when you only give uh, water. And this was true for diurnal and for nocturnal animals. So also this uh, shows that caffeine uh, can increase um, the phase, uh, the, the, the light uh, influence on, on, on the circadian clock. And what came more to that is that even uh, that it even suggested that caffeine may even slow down the clock a bit. Uh, we've we've done uh, some experiments ourselves in that as well, and we could see that okay, from in in constant darkness you don't see very a large difference, but in constant light, there's indeed uh, a, a lengthening of the period, but others also could find it in constant darkness, so at, and, and uh, in humans, in mice, and in uh, cell preparation. So uh, apparently, you can also slow down the clock or delay the clock with caffeine. Um, so uh, two years ago, almost two years ago, uh, we wrote a review about that, and this is sort of the overview of uh, what, what we have of, of uh, the eye giving the information to the suprachiasmatic nucleus and then giving the uh, influence in the rest activity rhythm. Uh, we also did, uh, I'm, I'm not showing you this, but, but uh, electroretinograms in the eye with, uh, with control animals and with sleep deprived animals, and there we didn't find uh, a, a difference. So apparently the, the rods and cones are not influenced by, by uh, sleep deprivation. But we know that the amplitude of, of the, the SCN can be reduced by sleep deprivation. We know that the light response uh, can be uh, reduced by sleep deprivation and recovered with caffeine. There was some uh, data from uh, Christina Schmidt that uh, the bolt signal in the SCN to a, a PVD task is influenced by sleep deprivation. And that you can increase, uh, decrease phase shifts by light uh, to the sleep deprivation and increase it with caffeine but also that your free running period may become uh, longer if you, if you use chronic caffeine. Now, last thing before I uh, wrap up, um, this chronic use of caffeine actually did make me, make me think a bit because um, I, I thought I saw something in the data and 
So we, we decided a couple of years ago to do another experiment and look at sleep because I, I, uh, I wasn't actually sure if chronic um, caffeine would do the same as acute caffeine. So we, what we did was we put uh, caffeine in the drinking water of animals, of mice, and looked on, on a baseline day and on the or control day and on day one and day 14 what their sleep wake would look like. And here are 12 and 24 hour values and uh, here we have the control situation, here we have the acute situation, this is the chronic situation and you can see at, from, from the averages here that indeed on the first day after uh, that they use caffeine they are more awake and they are sleeping less uh, than, the ba and than the control condition. But after 14 days on chronic caffeine, this is actually already uh, changed. You can see that uh, in this situation, there's less waking in the rest phase and, and more waking in the active phase. And these are the hourly values here on the right side. This is the caffeine is the black one. And you can see that they are actually sleeping much more during the light phase, sleeping less during the dark phase. Um, and what was even more interesting, we did a sleep deprivation, and, and Maria Panagiotou was, was, ha had a lot of experience with that already. And you can see that the control was, was relatively easy to keep awake, but with the caffeinated animals, it was just very difficult. And, and, and after the first hour, she started calling me and saying, OK, you have to help me because I can't keep them awake. And I was very surprised because uh, I expected that caffeine animals would actually uh, be easier to keep awake until we, after an analyzing the data, saw that actually also during this period that we tried to keep them awake, under baseline conditions, they would sleep much deeper here. This is slow wave activity uh, in the caffeine situation compared to this control situation. So they would have a much higher sleep pressure at the start of the light period than the control animal. So it was not so surprising that it was very difficult to keep them awake here. But it is surprising that they have this increased slow wave activity. What about humans? A year later, uh, a group in Basel actually had uh, humans on chronic caffeine and looked at placebo and caffeine situations. And they looked at the parameters of sleep uh, during a night of sleep and actually could not find any difference there. Also, in slow wave activity, they did not find an effect of, of caffeine compared to the placebo uh, condition. It is all very similar. Um, so the question is, is acute caffeine and chronic caffeine, is that really the same uh, thing? Now, take home message is uh, sleep homeostasis and the circadian clock together determine when you get sleepy and when you are less sleepy. And this can be modeled, and the model can be used to optimize sleep-wake timing. Uh, we have found that adenosine, a substance that is released during waking and makes you sleepy, also influences circadian clock functioning. And that caffeine, which is uh, the agonist of adenosine, does not only influence homeostatic sleep regulation, but also the circadian clock. And that chronic, chronic caffeine intake not necessarily influences sleep quality. It really depends on the person and the mass. Uh, but can delay your circadian clock and, and make us more evening type uh, people. And if you look at this from the human or patient perspective, if you accept that sleep deprivation decreases light input to the circadian clock and caffeine increases light input to the circadian clock, it might be an idea to use these kind of uh, treatments uh, on well slept people and maybe give them some caffeine with it to increase uh, the effect. And with that, uh, I would like to acknowledge our group. This is in the, the garden of, of, of Joachim Meyer, the head of our group. Um, and I also would like to acknowledge uh, Hefter van Diepen, who picked up the uh, uh, neuronal activity in the SCN and the caffeine responses uh, after a, a pilot uh, study that, that we did. She picked it up very well. Uh, Maria, who did the sleep deprivation in the caffeinated uh, chronic caffeine animals and, and uh, needed some more help. And this is uh, Robin Sponder, who, who did the, the retinograms uh, with me. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>